we knew from, from our perspective as, as activists that this was a, a moment of change, that what we had done before was now going to be different. Years old. In 1967, I became partners with uh, Craig Rodwell, who ran the first gay and lesbian uh, bookshop in the country, I, I believe in the world. Craig started a group called the Homophile Youth Movement, and I became a part of the group. I became vice chairman. We did our activism through the bookshop in communicating with people, in presenting visibility on the street. One evening we went out and we walked past the stone wall and there was a crowd of people that had started to form out there. The people told us that there was an arrest going on inside and that uh, people were being hurt. We didn't know what the extent of that was, but this was what we were hearing on the street. The action really started when they tried to bring the the people that they had arrested out of the bar and put them into a paddy wagon. People that were being arrested started shouting, help us, and people in the crowd started yelling at the police to let them go. When they didn't let them go, then the pennies and nickels and dimes and quarters started to fly and garbage from the uh, trash cans and that sort of thing. That went on throughout the night. Once it had really gotten underway, they had to call out more police, of course, because there were by now thousands of people that were uh, around the bar. There was almost no coverage of a riot, and the coverage that we got was very um, critical. It was a beautiful day like today. We started late. When we finally got going, a sense of urgency in the crowd to do this march that no one had done before was such that instead of walking to the park, we almost ran to the park. And one of my friends back then, Bob Kohler, who was in Gay Liberation Front, he had called it, well, we shouldn't call this the first march, we should call it the first run. Well, we were commemorating Stonewall. We were telling people that this, this was over that gay people were going to have a new approach to their liberation, and that was the march. They were not giving us a permit, and we, we had made it as clear as we possibly could to them that there would be a march that day, with or without the permit. We would, of course, prefer it be with a permit, um, but the... Um, Police didn't bring the permit to our apartment until uh, about two hours before the march. I felt safe. I, d I don't think everyone felt safe. I, but I have been working on this project for, for a year. And to me, it, I was fulfilling something as opposed to um, being concerned about myself. It was such a change for people to have this event that they could focus on. And uh, we never realized how great an event it was going to become. There are things that are said about Stonewall that I would say are not really accurate. What they do is they encourage people to get interested. So that's why I support the myths, because the myths help to get people interested. 
And then people can learn from the, themselves by reading a history or something like that and get a little more detail and maybe not forget about the myths, but not focus on them so much. There's great power in myths. The reason why the barricades are there are because the floats are there, the corporate sponsors. And if they would take the corporate sponsors out of the march and make it look less like a parade, I think that would be a, a, a good thing. Every year, for some people, as I've been seeing online, um, it's a party. And I, I've never thought of it that way. It's, it's, I never saw it that way. And I can't see it that way now. I, I see that we still need to march. We had no idea that the march would grow into what it's become today. What we wanted to do was get out there and present ourselves. Um, now the march is a different thing, and uh, in some ways good, in some ways bad. But uh, definitely I, I, I appreciated my role in being a part of it. <laughs>